<laughs> he has a strong background in career development and is often on the forefront of identifying trends that will impact the profession. And he is known to bring insight, experience, humor to his platform presentations. He's going to talk to us today about careers are made, not given. Career development as a personal responsibility, self-reflection, and its importance on focusing on intent, and the importance of investing in skill development to serve the mutual interests of the individual and the organization. So without further delay, please help me to welcome Dr. Lee Meadows. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm really beginning to understand the importance of having a relationship with the University of Michigan. And while I've never been offered a job, I do recognize the fact that uh, my colleague Mark, when he was introduced, uh, Janice said that she's going to encourage him to uh, rent a condo here in Ann Arbor. Um, so far, I've only been encouraged to rent a shack by the Gettys River. So I guess I've got some relationship building to do, but we'll work on that as we go. Ladies and gentlemen, it is nice to have you all here this morning. It's nice to be able to talk with you about one of, the, one of these topics that I enjoy really talking about, really trying to hone in, and what we're going to do is spend some time talking about what it means to be an employee at, at the University of Michigan, what it means to be an exceptional employee, what it means to have gone through this kind of year-long experience, and what some of the implications are for when you go back into the workplace. So I want to give you some things to think about, I want to give you some things to focus on, I want to give you some things to start to, to begin to explore, and to really begin to, begin to shape a lot of what it is that you are about to do. Now that you have been immersed in a year-long effort, the issue, the issue becomes you got to figure out what we're going to start doing with this. So if I might set the stage, let me start off by talking about what it means to be part of an exceptional organization. Now one of the things that oftentimes people who work in exceptional organizations take for granted is that they oftentimes take for granted that it also works that way in other places. And, in, and, and unless you've kind of gone out and visited other places and put your foot in the water of other organizations and had conversations, as Mark encouraged, encouraged you to do, have uh, conversations with people in other positions and other organizations, you don't really get a sense of what organizations do or don't do for that matter. So some of the things that happen here, while they may be normal to you, they aren't necessarily normal in terms of other organizations. For instance, one of the, one of the interesting HR issues that are going on out there right now is this whole notion of retention. And organizations really struggling with, how, how, is that, how, do you get, how do you get them there? But man, how do you keep them? Well, exceptional organizations have low retention issues. And I think you know why that is. Because one, they, have a, they create a place that's comfortable. They also encourage their employees to be valuable assets in terms of what's going on. But when you are used to that, you think that other places are doing the exact same thing. And I gotta tell you that while well, a lot of my consulting work does tend to center around this notion of how do you help folks, how do you help them retain the employees that they just spent so much time and energy and effort in staying in the organization. I do some work with a couple of, uh, with a couple of executive recruiters and one of the things that they typically like to do is once they place someone, they will check in about six months or a year later just to see how they're doing because the hope is that that individual is doing well. About 85% of the time among these executive recruiters, what they find is that when they do the follow-up interview six months or a year later, one of the things that the person will ask is, hey, do you have any more opportunities out there? Well, obviously the grass isn't always as green as people like to think it is, and oftentimes it's not that that individual isn't talented, it's not that that individual doesn't have skills, it's not that an individual doesn't know what he or she is doing, they're not in the right organization. And more often than that, those organizations don't spend the time and energy and effort to actually focus on how do we make employees better. So, exceptional organizations tend to have low retention issues. They also tend to have a culture of career exploration. So what does that mean? That means that employees are actively encouraged to look at other career possibilities within those geographical or global boundaries. In other words, their concern is, now that we have you, we want to keep you. But we, want, we don't want to pigeonhole you. We, don't want, to, we want, don't want to keep you in one spot where it's impossible for you to move. We want you to look around. We want you to have conversations 
with other individuals within the organization. We want you to explore other kinds of opportunities because that's how we contribute to your growth, that's how we contribute to your development, and that's how we sustain our ability to be an exceptional organization. So you're working here, the assumption is, well, isn't, isn't that what happened in other places? And the truth of the matter is, it doesn't. One of the other things that these kinds of organizations do is they look at the return on investment as a long-term strategy, as a long-term strategy. They're already thinking 10, 15, 20 years down the line with these particular employees. What are we doing? What are we, what are we uh, putting out there in terms of that's resonating with employees so that they know that this place that they work, this place in which they have, you know, have anchored their abilities and experiences recognizes that, encourages that, and my God, we want to keep it. We, want, you know, we don't want to share this talent with other organizations. We want to keep it here. One of, the, one of the interesting consulting assignments I had back in the 1980s, and I know for some of you, the idea of even saying 19 is horrible. But back in the 80s, I worked on an assignment with a National Car Rental, and during that time, National Car Rental in, in, in Minnesota and in Minneapolis was the premier organization for call centers. As call centers were starting to emerge, National Car Rental had one of the best. And as that industry began to grow in the Minneapolis area, one of the things that growing call centers would do was they would just raid National Car, National Car Rental. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't spend a lot of time and effort and resources in training and developing people, they would just steal them. They would just steal them. They'd offer them, I don't know, another dime an hour, another quarter an hour, uh, another dollar an hour. So they would learn at National Car Rental on how to work in the call center, and they would take those skills to other places. And one of the things that we began to ask is, well, do you want to be a training center for other call centers, or do you want to be a place that people come and want to work and stay? Now, we never got an answer to that question because my assignment ended and I had to move on. National Car Rental has gone through a number of acquisitions, but that question was always still looming for me. Are you going to be an organization that trains people to go to other organizations to use their skills, or are you going to be the kind of organization that says, well, we train them, we develop them, we got to figure out how we keep them. And keeping them becomes part of the whole sustaining effort. How do we begin to do that? So they see the return on investment, not as just something that happens in the next two or three months. They're thinking down the line. So for all of you, you become a long-term strategy that sustains the organization called the University of Michigan. And by going through this particular kind of program, that is an investment in which the organization wants to get a return. That's only fair, right? That's only fair. So for those of you going, well, wait a minute. Maybe I want to take my skills to another place. This place is saying, no, we want you to keep them here. Because as other issues begin to emerge within the structure, it's important for us to have those kinds of individuals who understand what it means to work in an exceptional organization. And one of the other things that these organizations do is they commit resources. They commit resources strategically, and they recognize that their most important resources are clearly financial. Right? There's a financial investment going on here in which they expect to reap some kind of benefit. There's also the people investment. And you know, Socrates and Plato and all these folks, they started talking about this stuff way back in the day. So every time someone looks at me and goes, you mean I got to develop my people? Yeah, that's not a new thought. That's been around for a long time. But exceptional organizations know that when they develop their people, they are by definition developing their ability to grow. And of course, time. When you're 22, time doesn't seem to matter very much, right? Because it always seems like it's always in abundance. You know, I always got time. I'm 22, I'm 20, I got time. When are you gonna do this? I got time. Time is just, you know, it's this fluid, abstract concept in which you can just kind of lollygag your way back and forth, in and out, up and down. It doesn't matter until you turn 40. <laughs> And all of a sudden, time has a very finite dimension to it. And so by, by, the time you, yeah, by the time you cycle this thing around, all of a sudden, the relationships that you had in your 20s, 
But you can just kind of lolling your way in and out, in and out, out. And you turn 40 and all of a sudden, listen, I, I don't have time for this. I really don't have time for this. Let me tell you about all the issues going on in my, on in my life. When I was 23, I didn't mind listening to them. I'm coming back at you. I didn't mind listening to them at 23. At 40, I really don't want to hear that. I really don't want, and why? Because my time is now important to me, right? And I can measure activities, I can measure relationships in exact minutes, degrees, and seconds. And any time that I spend my time wasted in, here's one, you know, a one hour meeting that feels like six. <laughs> right? We started this meeting at one o'clock, and for some strange reason, every time I look at my watch, it's 1.10. I've been looking at my watch <laughs> for the last two hours, and that thing hasn't changed. Why? <laughs> Why? Because one of the things that, do, that we don't do well is we don't facilitate meetings well and take advantage of the fact and recognize that time is an important resource inside of an organization. And so wasting time is not something that becomes part of any exceptional organization's culture. They want you to account for it, but they also want you to be aware of it. So even if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, how productive is that? If it's a meeting, how productive is that? If it's some major project, how productive is that? Because time is an irrevocable resource that an organization can't get back once it gives it to you. So finance, people, and that will always come up as a thing, but time, time as an irrevocable resource that an organization counts on in terms of getting things done and being able to sustain itself. All right, so here's what happens. <clears throat> You spent a year going through this program. You spent a year going through the program. You've had opportunities to do projects. You've learned different kinds of skills. You've gotten different kinds of perspectives. You have immersed yourself in this experience so that as we see at this capstone, you are essentially wrestling with the same issue that Bruce Wayne wrestled with when he learned how to be a good detective, became athletic, and all that, he was faced with the same question that you're faced with now, and that is, now what? Now what? Now that I know this, and we are not encouraging you all to grab a mask and a cape and go leap off the top of the U of M football stadium in terms of a now what? But the question now what becomes important, because now that I know this, now that I know this, what do I do with it? All right, what do I do with it? And let me, let, me, let me let you in on a little bit secret. You're actually kind of scary to some people back in the workplace now. All right, because they saw you kind of going out and doing this and doing that and all that. And maybe they, maybe they understood it. Maybe some did, maybe some didn't. But now you're coming back, all right? They're coming, after a year long, a uh, year long journey down a particular path, now you're coming back. And the now what question becomes even more important for, any, for your particular unit, your particular department, whoever it was that signed off and said, yes, please go through this experience, now we've got to look at you know, what's going to be the return on investment. Here's going to, and here's one of the issues we have to think about when we, when we start to address this particular, this particular now what question. Some will get it, and some won't. Some will understand, and some won't. Some will ask you questions, and some won't. Some will turn you loose in their department, and some won't. Because at this point in time in your life, you occupy a body of knowledge and skills and insight that in theory, when applied to problems inside of an organization, should do nothing but make the place better. And you will do that. But for some of us, there may be some hurdles with that. Because here's one of the things that, be here's one of the things that begins to happen. I didn't know this was, I didn't know this wasn't doing that. All right, here's one of the things that begins to happen. Now that you've done this, you have been given what I call a double O to challenge the status quo. You can be seven, <laughs> you can be six, but you've been given a double O to challenge the status quo, and why? Because you've gone through an experience in which the organization has invested some time and energy in you, and now, one of the things that becomes important is when you go back 
and look at what's going on inside of your organization, you got a chance to ask yourself some very pertinent questions about the way we do things. That's what makes you dangerous, right? That's what makes you dangerous. As a professor at Walsh College, one of the things that I typically hear from my students is we, I, I teach, we teach courses at night, we talk about stuff, they go back to the workplace and try stuff. And typically, some of the feedback that I get is that whenever they bring up something in a meeting or in a department or something like that, they'll say, oh, you went to class last night, didn't you? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, can you hold that till we get through this six-hour meeting? We could. We could. Every time you begin to learn something, you begin to build on something, you begin to talk these things through, what you're doing is you're changing the status quo of that organization. Right? And maybe not at a huge level, maybe not at a big level, maybe not at something that's tremendous. Maybe it's a series of small things that the organization has consistently done and does not recognize that it doesn't have to do it that way anymore. So you become the, question, the person who asks the what if, or the why do we, or have we considered this, or have we thought about that, right? to the point where you start to get the heads ringing, and they start to get upset with you. Don't ask me any more questions. I haven't had my Starbucks cafe latte. <laughs> Bring it up after lunch. Maybe I can think about it then. All right? But what are they doing? All right? They're fighting the obvious. And the obvious is that you have gone through a particular experience unlike what other organizations do. And that is the opportunity to learn and to develop and to take that learning and development to a level in terms of its application that's rarely seen. Right? We all, for the most part, are hands-on kinds of people. Right? I can hang with abstract concepts with the, great, with, with the best of them. You put Socrates and Plato and Aristotle right in front of me, I'm glad to have a philosophical discussion with them. But I will send them back because at some point in time, what's abstract and philosophical has to get, has to get turned into what's practical. Right? How do we get things done around here? And building a car is not an abstract concept. Right? Creating a new internet service is not an abstract concept. It starts abstract, but the issue becomes, how do you make it work? You know, what do you begin to do from here? All right, how, does this, how does this stuff begin to happen? How do I begin to use all these things that I've learned inside of, inside of this organization so that they can benefit? Recognizing that, well, yeah, we've kind of put the landscape out there for you to do anyway. So why should you be taking on these challenges? Why should you be trying to get through a lot of these particular things like this? So we challenge the status quo all right, now let me, change the, let me change the language just a little bit because there's a second part to this. Not only you challenge the status quo, you have to challenge your status quo. And that's what you've done. All right, whatever it was that you were thinking a year ago when you were immersed in your own status quo, I'm not, not talking about position title or anything like that, but in other words, the realization that I've got a certain set of skills, uh, a certain amount of time, I've done things a certain kind of way. Is this the way I wish to remain? Most people inside of the organizations don't challenge their own status quo. In other words, they don't think about who they are and what they're doing and how long they've been doing that. Recognizing something Mark talked about earlier in terms of how the work world is changing, in that when's the last time you, how many, how many of you even know at one point in time you had this thing called longhand? All right, so you and I can, yeah, we watched Bastard Father in the 1950s. All right, longhand, a skill that's gone away. Some even make, some of you are even making an argue, argument that cursive writing has gone away, you know, in favor of something else. Things transition, and that oftentimes when people get caught off guard, all right. I used to be a, I was out, I've been a bookkeeper since 1847 and that's what I know. Well, that creates a very interesting issue because when that transitions into something else, are you able to transition with it? Because society and technology in the world keeps moving forward, right? It does, in other words, it's very impolite to, to, to us as individuals when we only know how to do one thing and have only done that one thing for as long as we can remember. The world is very impolite to us. 
So we have to adapt, we have to learn, we have to adjust, but not everybody, not everybody embraces that. Well, this is a group that did. All right, you challenge your own status quo. You, whatever you were a year ago, you're not that person now. Ask anybody. Ask them. Ask your spouse. Who do you think I am now? I don't know. Ask your close friends. What do you, who do you think I am now? I don't recognize you anymore. The person you report to, what do you think? You're scaring me. <laughs> you're scaring me. Why? Because for the last year, you have spent time learning how to be someone different, how to do some things differently, and how to act in a way that the organization says, yes, we want to continue to sustain this. So from this point forward, you will always challenge your, you will always challenge your status quo. You will never be satisfied with who you are and what you're accomplishing because you're always looking for what's that next thing that I can do? What's that next piece of learning that I can take on? What's that next challenging assignment that I can take on? What's that next thing that I can do that's gonna make me grow as an individual? We did that deliberately to you. We own up to it. Now you gotta live with it. But guess what? So does the organization in which we all reside. So let me talk about a couple other things here. If I can make this, all right. Anybody who's ever done anything around change, whether it's individual change, organizational change, group change, recognizes that all change encounters some kind of resistance. There's always some form of resistance to change. And when you go back, having graduated, received a certification, when you go back, the thing you have to be mindful of are the resistors. The resistors. Well, who do you think you are to come in and make a suggestion about how we do things around here? Who do I think I am? I'm that person that just spent the last year learning how to do that. So you've got to be mindful of how do I, be, how do I position these kinds of discussions? You know, who do I begin to build alliances in which this discussion is going to be well received? And recognize, you know, recognize that people resist change oftentimes because they don't want its impact to impact them. You know, we get very comfortable with the status quo. We get very comfortable in our comfort zones, right? It's nice to know that, how many of you, when you drive to work in the morning, you drive the same route every day? Yeah, most of us do. And sometimes you can even put it on, you can even put it on mind control. I mean, they, they got self-driving cars, but a lot of you do that anyway, don't you? You kind of fall asleep, the car gets you there, right? Because there was a, well, you know, oh, I've seen some of you in the mirrors. <laughs> All right? And why? Because I'm, a, I'm in a pattern. I'm in a pattern that works for me. And when do we get the most upset when our pattern is disrupted? The beginning of spring when the orange and white barrels get rolled out. <laughs> oh, that first day? <laughs> that first day, I think the state troop would just pull people over on general principle. See, why? Because you looked like you were having a bad time trying to get here. <laughs> because what are we doing? Well, I, was, I, I, gotta re, I gotta adjust my pattern, right? And I, I don't wanna do that, but I have to because <clears throat> I've got this driving pattern that works for me. And now you've disrupted it, and how dare you do something like that? Well, that's no different inside of organizations. No different whatsoever. You know, we have patterns, we have comfort zones, we have ways of doing things, we have we, have, we, we can become somewhat an, of an automaton around the, re, the repetition of activities. In fact, someone would even argue, Mark, someone would even argue, there is comfort in repetition, right? There is comfort in repetition, because why? I don't have to think about it. So now I can think about other things. I can think about how Judge Judy is doing something. I can, I can, and for the life of me, I still don't know why I'm supposed to be concerned about the Cardassians, but apparently, they keep showing up, people keep saying, aren't you concerned about the Kardashians? I don't know why I'm supposed to be concerned about them. I think I'm too busy to be, to be concerned about them. But if there is comfort in repetition, guess what? I can take time out to think about, I wonder how the Kardashians are doing today. Let me turn on YouTube and find out. No, gang, 
No, <laughs> no, no, no. There's, there's always resistance. So your issue, any, any Star Trek people in the room? None? One or two. All right. So if I say resistance is futile, you get, you get me. All right. That, that's what we've just done to you. All right. We know, we know that there is resistance in the ranks. And some of it may even be the person to whom you report. All right. Some of it may be even your peer group. But there's resistance in the ranks because change disrupts patterns. And when folks say, we don't, we don't adapt, so you, must, you have to know how to adapt. You live in Michigan. So don't tell me you're incapable of adapting, because you do. All right? We're sitting out here on this beautiful day on winter, but it could rain, it could, rain, it could snow Saturday. What do we know? All right? We don't know anything like that, anything like that. But we adapt. People inside of organizations can adapt just as well, and they do. What they attempt to do is to resist the impact of what's going to happen to them. So you begin to strategically figure out, you got to identify who are the resistors, and you got to build an alliance. Right? What's going to be their level of resistance? Now, what becomes, what are some of the things that they are concerned about? And oftentimes, it's, they don't get upset. They don't like the way change is introduced. And change is disruptive, gang. It is disruptive. Now we all, you know, all of us, I mean, my God, right? Every time I think about the fact that, you know, I still have an eight-track player, and I don't understand why this whole music thing kind of evolved. And see, Mark, most of them didn't even know what I was talking about. All right? It's so an eight-track player, what is that? Something from the 17th century? Yeah, something, somewhere along that. In other words, <laughs> that some of us, we resist change, we don't even know it. Right? We don't even know it. One of the questions I always ask individuals when we're trying to implement something, I when I, and I can sense they're resisting, I say, what are you resisting? I'm not resisting. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. I'm not. You are. I am not resisting. Yes, you are. Why are you resisting? That's a self-reflective question. Right? That's a self-reflective question. Because if you ask it, they are obligated to answer it even if they haven't even thought about it. Most of the time, we don't know why we're resisting. We just know that it disrupts our patterns. So we got to be beware the resistors, because as much as you've been imbued with these new skills and this new development, there'll be some who'll jump on board with you, but there'll be others who'll, who'll fight you. Who'll fight you, because all of, a, all of a sudden, you are interfering and disrupting what they normally and typically do. You're like your orange and white barrel at the beginning of the spring. And as much as they love to run you over, which is what a lot of us tend to do, as much as they want to run, run, run you over, you know that now that you have this, the organization itself has already said to you, yes, by all means, do. By all means, do. Some of the things that leaders do, some of the more effective leaders, do things that are what I call unprecedented, all right? Unprecedented, and I want you to hang on to that thought because when we look at the history of, in the evolution of, of effective leaders, that somewhere in there, they identify these things, they do things that are what we call unprecedented. Never been done before, never seen before, no one even thought about it. It's a mindset, ladies and gentlemen. It's a mindset, all right? Whether it's the, where's the Model A in terms of an unprecedented thought or the light bulb that was an unprecedented thought, the, uh, the assembly line, which was an unprecedented thought, Google, which was an unprecedented thought, the iPod was an unprecedented thought, and all those things in between. Women in the workplace was an unprecedented thought. But somewhere along the way, somebody said, we've got to take what's unprecedented and make it precedent. Now, when I do these kinds of presentations and I talk about what it means to be unprecedented, and I use all the examples that I've, that I've, that I've used in front of you, one of the things that I'll see on, typically on feedback forms is that, well, that was a nice idea, Dr. Meadows, but that's not how we do things right. We've never had any unprecedented things happen around here. Uh, we're not, our culture isn't designed to allow us to do unprecedented things, and I, I get it. I get it. So it remains somewhat abstract. But 
I'm here to tell you, and hold on to your seats, that if there is a karma in the universe, when I was thinking about this question, it was revealed to me. A light shone down from a tree and gave me exactly what I was looking for that makes perfect sense for this setting. So let me set the stage. How many football coaches would load up a football team, fly them all the way over to Italy to play, to practice, and to learn? Go ahead and Google it. Ask the question. What you're going to come up with is a big zero. A football coach takes an entire team to Italy. Now, I think you all know what coach I'm referring to, and I think you all know what team I'm referring to, and this is not a sports, com this is not a sports conversation, so come back. It's a process conversation. It's an activities conversation. How unprecedented, right? So that wasn't just about playing football. That was about establishing a culture of learning. For us, for, Mark, for me and Mark, that is the quintessential team building activity. Think about the impact of something like that. Right? Even if you're not a sports fan, think about the impact of something like that. For all those guys on that team, I would bet some are going to probably end up as football coaches somewhere. Well, guess what? Guess how they've already changed the lives of the, of the students that they come in contact with. And why? Because they went through an unprecedented experience that transcends winning seasons, that transcends bowl games, but creates a culture of learning that is consistent with what happens at the University of Michigan. Imagine that. Imagine that. You know who I feel sorry for when those, when those, when those guys get older and they go to uh, do a lot of those things? I feel sorry for the, the principals of their schools, the superintendents of their school districts, the, the, athletic, the athletic deans at their schools, because, because they have gone through the experience, they know what it's like. And you can't do something like that unless the person you report to also recognizes that it's unprecedented and doesn't stand in the way. In fact, acknowledges it. We've all, you know, we've all had work experience. You know, I've, I've had work experiences where I, I report to someone and say, listen, I want to take my, you know, my two part-time employees to a uh, Toledo Mud Hen game. Um, the tickets are relatively expensive. They are, you know, they're famous, you know, they're famous minor league baseball team. It'll be a nice outing. <laughs> and you, and you, you, can, you can hear them hyperventilating, all right, already. I mean, you want to, like, isn't that across the border? Yeah, but they don't need a passport. All right, so let's take that issue off the table. Well, you sure that they, they, do, do we have to do that? Well, it's not a question of have to. I think it'd be a great team building, bonding kind of experience. So I would like, I would like to do this. Well, uh, can't they just go to a softball game? Yeah, they, they could, but I want to take them to this. So we finally, so we finally compromise. And what we compromise is we get a VCR tape of Dodgeball, the underdog story. <laughs> what makes things unprecedented? The willingness of someone to think outside of how they normally think, and it sure helps to have someone in the trenches with you who gets it, who gets it. For some of you, that won't be an issue. For others of you, you're going to have to help them get it. You're going to have to help them see it. Now, I've given you an example. All right, so you, when you make a request, and they start to hyperventilate, and the eyes start to bug and all that, you say to them, well, it's not like I'm asking you to move a football team to Italy. <laughs> so anything short of that, we can handle. All right. So with that, <clears throat> what begins to happen? What do we want? We want <laughs> the places where we work and where we learn. We like to think of it as being our Broadway, that when we come to this place of lights and cameras and attention and all that, that it is one of those places where we could, you know, bask in the spotlight of our activities, but continue to learn from the day-to-day -day things that we do. 
Now that's what makes a Broadway exceptional organization really work. And that is the fact that it sets out this precedent for people to think about, and then it sustains it, it encourages it, it moves it forward, all right? It doesn't, it, it doesn't retreat in the midst of any kind of resistance. It says to its employees, here are the lights, here's the camera, here's the action. Go put on a show, do your thing, make it happen, make us better, all right? Make us better by the things that you do. So we don't have to go looking for Broadway. We create it by being employees, exceptional employees, and exceptional organizations. And with that, let me give you the now what rules. <laughs> the now what rules. Rule number one, don't sit on your talent. Don't sit on your talent. And don't let anyone else sit on your talent. And what do I mean by that? You've just learned a lot. You've just, you've enhanced your talent. Going back to the organization and doing nothing with it, that's the biggest offense you could do to everything that you've just gone through. So if you face some challenges because you've got to take it back, hey, don't sit on it, move it. Make it happen. And if and when folks resist, who's going to resist? It's mostly minor resistance. Most folks, most of the time, are going to be okay with that. All right? Make sure you ride the wave and not the elephant. Because things are always moving. And they move with tidal wave kind of precision. And one of the things that becomes important for anyone working in any organization that encourages these kinds of activities is to know how to ride that wave. It's to know how to ride that wave, to see where it's going. All right, to do the kind of research that Mark talked about that prepares you for the changes that are about to happen. You've also got to be able to smile at their, smile at their resistance because it confuses them. All right, which I don't think we can do that. They just smile because now they're wondering what's going on back there. All right, what's going on back there? The smile means that for rule number four, no is irrelevant. Right? No is irrelevant. Why do people say no? Probably mostly because of their own insecurities. Right? Mostly because of their own insecurities. And I've even been known to, I, I've been known to say to people in positions of authority, um, why are you, allowing your, are you allowing your insecurities to influence your position of authority in terms of the request that I just made? And they look at me and go, I don't understand what you just asked me. Think about it. Think about it. No typically means that I'm insecure about what you just asked me to do. So you've got to figure out, then how do I manage the resistance and the no that comes from that? I want you to celebrate what you know, what you now know. Right? One of the things about whether it's a, you know, a, a degree from a college or a certification or this kind of, cap, this kind of capstone event is once you've been imbued with the knowledge, you can't go back. All right? You can't go back. All right? you, can't become the, you can't become that person who, 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 rash, who, who does rationing of M&Ms to people stranded on an uncharted island because you're afraid to do something. You've got to value who you are and what you do. And when others don't, you look for ways to make that happen yourself. What's happened here? This is a rare moment. This is a rare moment because it is unprecedented and unlike anything else that happens in most organizations. And when you go out, when you start doing your curiosity interviews, you're going to find that there are more people trying to get to where you are than those who are leaving. And you know what? That makes for a great organization. Ladies and gentlemen, I congratulate you on what you've accomplished. I want you to move forward and I encourage you to, by all means, use everything that you've learned in the best way that you can. And know what? Become your own cohort. Because there will be times, there will be times when you will need someone to talk to. And the person who, who you're talking to does not understand what you've been through. But you do. But you do. It's only in that way that the geographical boundaries called University of Michigan will continue to advance and sustain 
and to grow. So, having said all that, are we going to do questions and answers? Going once? Are we doing, are we doing, are we Q&A? We are? Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Oh, now, the question is, are there any books that I can recommend in terms of resistance to change management? Um, what I would ask you to do is just go ahead and Google the term um, and pull it up because there's a, a whole bunch of books, a whole bunch of articles, um, and people talk about it, and they, they, they talk about it all the time. And I think the thing that's important to that is the strategies for how you begin to minimize the resistance to change. That's the thing you want to look for. What are some of the strategies that are out there? Uh, a questioning, uh, the questioning process is one way of doing it. I, I, I don't mind asking, why are you resisting this? You know, what's, you know, what's going on here? Well, I have my reasons. Well, what are the reasons? Yeah. Help me understand you know, why you are hyperventilating <laughs> because of a particular budget request. And sometimes just calling it out like that can be, it, I found this to be, tend to be a very excellent strategy. All right. Uh, we got one in the back, okay. We got a mic, coming at you. In your experience, is it wiser to get a team together to kind of attack the beast from okay. different angles, or is it better to just go one-on-one -on -one with the leadership? Okay, I, I didn't quite hear you, so give it to me again. In your experience, is it better to kind of build your team and then kind of go at the leadership, or, and I don't mean go at it that aggressively, yeah. sorry, <laughs> or is it something that you should set up as a one-on-one? -on -one? Oh, I, I think you build your team right from the beginning. All right, you, you figure out where, where the strengths, where the weaknesses, where's the areas for improvement. You build that collectively first. And once you've gotten that, then you, what you have to do is you find those assignments that allow you to show what the team can do and show quickly. Because one of the, you know, one of the things, one of the, the, the ways of minimizing resistance is through activity, all right, and through results. And when people can see results of what happens when a, a good team comes together and gets something done, then they begin to realize, oh, okay, well, I guess I can go with this because guess what? It's making my life a little easier. All right. So, yeah, Bob, I think you should always build it first. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Matters, when do you, or how do you figure out when the resistance isn't changing and you may have to move on and um, kind of like in the other presentation, like either go sideways or move on and all I, all I would in terms of that question all I would do is reinforce that there is you know we in and uh, in change management theory those folks are referred to as laggards all right and at, you can spend a lot of time and energy and effort trying to convince them to come forward on something or you can do as what already been suggested you take the folks who are already pretty much on board and you work with them um, because it's a lot more fun <laughs> All right, you can see a lot more productivity and activity that comes from that. And in time, all right, in time, those of you who are not resisting the change and moving forward, you set the precedent for those who don't want to change. So at some point in time, at some point in time, they got to give up the eight track player and buy an iPod. Right? They, they, they're just going to have to. Because the organization is no longer about eight track players, it's about iPods. And they'll see that. So they'll either adapt or they'll leave. All right, so have a lot more fun with the folks who aren't resisting it. All right. Going back here. Go back here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this was really fun. Um, we all work at the U of M, which you called an exceptional organization. What would you say to a room full of people who look like us at all stages in our careers who are trying to get in the door? To get, to get in this door? Are you kidding? I, Gene didn't even want to let me in here. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond begging and pleading, that you know, it's it's an excellent question. I know from a couple of uh, folks that I know who work in human resources ar ar around this. Yeah, they get a lot of applications. If you want to try to get in the University of Michigan, I think you have to figure out who do I know, who do, with whom can I have conversations, those curiosity interviews. If this is the place you where you're going to work, you got to talk with people who are already working here. 
let them be, become that network that you need in order to um, gain access to it. And believe me, there's a lot of folks who want to come here. All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> One more question. Microphone, here we go. Hi, um, I'm actually with um, the U of M Libraries. And I just wanted to point out um, a comment from the first question. We actually have a lot of resources in our collection about change management. Many of them are eBooks. And if you're affiliated with the university in any way, um, faculty, staff, students, you, everyone has access to those, as well as articles and journals about change management, about um, resistance. So, and if you need help finding those, um, the librarians are here to help. There you go, see? That's how it works. That's how it works, all right? I can't top that one. So, go do it, gang. <laughs> go do it. Thank you. So, before you leave the stage, we want to thank our presenter, Dr. Meadows, for Mark, the way we do Mark. it university style. And we want to also bring up Mark Sane from TIA Craft. So, we want to make sure that we present them in the fashion of Go Blue. So we have something for each of our presenters, but before I do that, can we please give a Go Blue round of applause for our presenters, please? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. We have these baskets for you as a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you kindly. Thank you all. I have a us. Thank you all. Go make a difference, gang. Go make a difference. So, um, as part of our closing remarks, I wanted to acknowledge everyone that played a part in today's uh, event. But I couldn't start without acknowledging the most important people in the room. And that's all of our participants in this program. You have made sacrifices. You have participated, you have shown up, you have been present, and you have invested in yourselves. So I encourage you as you go back, each of you, to find time, make an appointment with your supervisor, manager, sit down, talk about what have you learned throughout this event. But above all, thank them for participating and playing a role in your future journey. Thank them for having enough, um, seeing something in you that they wanted to invest in and continue. But take the time to say thank you. Some of you have asked, what happens next? Well, excellent question. In a few days, you will receive an evaluation. And on there, we ask you to complete the evaluation in its entirety. Your comments are important. It is through you and those comments through these evaluations that we will get the opportunity to then compile those results and then prepare a report that we present to leadership in hope of continuing the program probably 2018, 2019. But we need your involvement, so when you receive the evaluation, we ask you to complete it. This is ongoing investment in yourself. I'd also like to thank the program committee who has been instrumental in this. There's a lot of hands behind the scenes um, that go into this to make this uh, program and this complete program work. So they are in the back of the room, so I'm gonna ask them to at least raise their hand as I call upon them. Uh, Janice Rubin. Carrie Ann Tupac. Tarnisha McLaughlin. Jasmine Williams. And I gotta tell you, support is what makes any program run. There's always some person who never sleeps at night, who's trying to do things. Um, Try to remember the detail because the devil is the detail. And for our team, 
it was our support person, Silka Masulo. And then our fairy godmother who waves her wand to make things happen. How we never know how it's going to happen, but somehow it happens. And she waves her wand. And we appreciate her so much. She has been the cornerstone to this program. It is her baby, and she has, she has served it, nursed it well, and it is walking and heading to running now. So I would like for all of you to stand to your feet and acknowledge Jean Tennyson. So to thank all of you for your patience in coming out today, we are going to uh, hand out a little small token to some of you, um, these plants that we have here. If I could get the group to come up and start handing them out. And we're going to first do this based on seniority, OK? Because we don't have enough for everybody. So you're going to go on seniority. So I'm going to ask those of you with Ah, uh, let's go 40 years or more if you raise your hand. Ha <laughs> ha, I didn't think so. Okay, we'll take it down a bit. How about 30 years or more? Don't be ashamed, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. Yes. All right, now, 20, between 20 and 30 years. Awesome. And I see a couple hands in the back. We'll get to you. Is that it? Oh, we have the ones on the front. Okay. So, how many years did I leave off at? So I'm up to 20. OK. So now we'll go 15 to 20 years. We good? All right. Now, this is the moment you're waiting for, huh? 10 to 15 years. Whoa, whoa. Let's see. We might not have enough. How many is that? OK, we got one on this table to go to this young lady here. Keep your hand up. Okay, was there one on this table? So, we appreciate your years of service in all these hands, but <laughs> how about you be first in line for autograph signing of Dr. Lee Meadows' book? <laughs> <laughs> But we want, I, I love to see the years of service here. We thank you all for investing in yourself. We thank you all for coming out today. We truly appreciate you. And we ask you to continue your journey. Continue to read. Continue to take the nuggets that you learned from today. Continue to write your autobiography and extrapolate information to write that resume that sells yourself to potential employers. Continue to network. There are a lot of resources around you, and as you go back, use those opportunities to network, to invest in yourself. But above all, continue. You are worth the investment, and we appreciate you. Give yourself all a round of applause, and thank you.